there was a Sabbath, and Jesus had one set of opinions that other, others had different opinions about. Pretty much it looks like Jesus uh, was law observant. Jesus was almost certainly a teacher of the law. If Jesus was a teacher of any sort, he was certainly a Jewish teacher. What does a Jewish teacher teach in the first century? He teaches the law, his interpretation of the law. So Jesus observed the law, and he taught the law. Jesus did have disagreements with other teachers, especially Pharisees. <clears throat> Jesus wasn't the only one who had disagreements with Pharisees. Sadducees had disagreements with Pharisees. Essenes had disagreements with Pharisees. And most especially, Pharisees had disagreements with Pharisees. Uh, there were all sorts of disagreements within Judaism. It continues down to today, as you know. Jesus had disagreements with other teachers. It doesn't make him anti-Jewish or un-Jewish or non-Jewish or against the law. It simply makes him a, a Jewish teacher. Did Jesus plan to start a new religion? Virtually everybody who works on the historical Jesus today from a critical perspective will say the answer is no. Jesus was not planning to start some kind of new religion that was separate from Judaism. Jesus was a Jew who followed Jewish customs and kept the Jewish law and was a Jewish teacher who had Jewish disciples whom he taught the Jew his understanding of the Jewish law. Jesus may have wanted to uh, present his own interpretation of what it meant to be one of the people of God, but that wasn't to start a new religion, Christianity. Christianity starts after Jesus' day. It's not something that Jesus himself wanted to start. And so, if that's the case, why did Christians end up changing what it was that Jesus taught? So, this last set of points is what I'm going to conclude with. It's going to take me about 10 minutes, I think, to develop this point. After Jesus died, his followers proclaimed that he was the Jewish Messiah. It may be that some of Jesus' followers thought that he was the Messiah before he died, but it is certain that after he died, his followers were calling him the Messiah. They called him the Messiah so much and so frequently that in fact, Messiah did become his last name. Christ becomes functioning as a name in Christianity. Jesus Christ or Jesus Messiah. Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah. What does it mean to call somebody the Messiah? Here's another thing that my students absolutely don't understand. My students tend to think that if you call somebody Messiah, that means you're calling them God. No. Being the Messiah has nothing to do with being God for most Jews. It, it could have a divine input for, for most Jews, no. Being the Messiah was not being God. What was it then? So, let me give you just the very brief history lesson on the term Messiah. <coughs> the word Messiah in Hebrew, like the Greek word Christ, literally means anointed one. The anointed one. Originally, it was used of the kings of Israel. The king of Israel, starting with King Saul, the first king, then King David, then King Solomon, the kings were made king, say, during a coronation ceremony by having oil poured on their head. Part of the coronation ceremony had oil poured on their head. They were anointed with oil as a sign of divine favor. Favored by God, the anointed one. The anointed one originally refers to the king. And in the, uh, in the Christian Old Testament, in the book of 2 Samuel, the second king, the great king David, is told by God that he will always have a descendant sitting on the throne. David will always have a descendant sitting on the throne, the kingly throne, and so there will always be a Davidic king in Jerusalem. So that was true for about 400 years. There, always, there was a dynasty, a Davidic dynasty, where there was a king on the throne, until the Babylonians came in and destroyed Jerusalem and took the king off the throne. What are people supposed to make of this promise of God that there will always be a Davidic king on the throne, an anointed one on the throne, if there's no longer a king on the throne? 
some Jewish thinkers started to think that there'd be a future king on the throne, a future anointed one. The Messiah was that future anointed one, a king like David, a great political military leader who would sit on the throne and reestablish Israel as a state, as a kingdom. By the time of Jesus, there were people who expected that the future Messiah would be that kingly figure. There were other Jews who had other expectations about what a future anointed one would be. There were some who thought that this, this future figure who led Israel would be more of a cosmic figure, a, a divine-like being who would come from heaven to destroy the enemies of God and set up God's kingdom on earth. Call him, call him the Messiah, call him the Son of Man, call him, call him, there are various things they call him. This future one. There are other Jews who expected that the future ruler of Israel would be a great priest who would interpret the law of God for his people and rule over his people uh, with, with a very uh, stern fist, but as a great interpreter of the law, a powerful priest who would rule the people. There are various expectations about what the, the Messiah would be like. But one thing all of these expectations had in common was that the Messiah would be a future figure of grandeur and power who would rule over the people of Israel, typically would overthrow the enemy and set up Israel as its own kingdom. A figure of grandeur and power. Christians came along and they said, Jesus is the Messiah. There was a very real problem with that declaration. Everyone knew that Jesus had been crucified. Jesus did not destroy the enemy and set up a kingdom in Israel. Jesus was destroyed by the enemy. Jesus was publicly tortured to death, humiliated and tortured to death. That's the Messiah? That's not the Messiah, that's the opposite of the Messiah. So when I try to get my students to understand what, uh, what it's like for, uh, for a first century Jew to agree Jesus is the Messiah, a crucified criminal is the Messiah, uh, what I used to do, I can't do it anymore because now my students don't remember who David Koresh was, but what I used to do was I would say that the, the kind of gut feeling you'd have by saying Jesus is the Messiah is a gut feeling that you yourself would have that I told you that I think David Koresh is the Lord of the universe. David Koresh, you mean that guy at Waco, the Branch Davidian, and stockpiling arms and abusing kids, and, and, and who got killed by the FBI? That's the Lord of the Universe? Yes, that's the Lord of the Universe. What are you, crazy? That, so that, so, yeah, so I used to get in trouble with this in my, uh, in my class, because every year I get my course evaluations back, and you get about a half a dozen who would say, I can't believe the urban thinks that David Koresh is the Lord of the Universe. <laughs> So that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that, that it's just David Koresh is the opposite for, for, most, pe for most people. So uh, Christians said that Jesus was the Messiah, and most Jews absolutely rejected it. The vast majority of Jews did and do reject this claim. While the early Christians were proclaiming that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, you have the phenomenon of the Apostle Paul. Paul himself was a Jew, uh, was a Pharisee, uh, was uh, a, a, apparently a strict and highly uh, religious Jew who, because of the vision that he had of Jesus, came to think that Jesus had been raised from the dead. Paul came to think, apparently, maybe after his conversion, right after his conversion, came to think that Jesus' death was absolutely the key to salvation, to being made right with God. And that since Jesus' death is what made people right with God, nothing else had any relationship to being right with God. It was only the death and resurrection of Jesus that mattered. Paul had Paul been raised as a law-observant Jew who thought that the law really mattered. But he came to think that when it came to a relationship with God, the law actually didn't matter. Because if the law mattered, God wouldn't have had Jesus die. Paul knew that God had had Jesus die, 
Because Paul knew that Jesus had been raised from the dead. If Jesus got raised from the dead, the only way he'd get raised from the dead is if God raised him. If God raised him, that shows that God favored him. If God favored him, then his death must have been something God planned. His death must be some kind of sacrifice for others. But that means that it's the sacrifice of Jesus that matters, not the law. And so Paul came to think that people could be right with God, could have salvation apart from the law by believing in the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so Paul saw himself as the apostle to the Gentiles. He wanted to convert Gentiles. Uh, and he did. He started his Gentile mission. Paul converted Gentiles, and Paul had much more success than his, Jew than his counterparts were trying to convert Jews. Mainly Gentiles were converting to Christianity. If you've got a situation where most Jews are rejecting the message of Jesus, and most of the people who are accepting the message of Jesus are Gentiles, who don't keep the Jewish law, why do Christians keep the Old Testament? Why do Christians keep the law if they're not going to follow the law? And why even have an Old Testament? There are lots of reasons why historically Christianity kept the Old Testament. Let me give you one of the reasons that most people have not thought of. During Paul's day, after Paul's day, Christians found opposition from their uh, pagan neighbors and from the Roman rulers on some occasions. Christians were attacked for a reason that might not make much sense today, but made a lot of sense in the ancient world. When it came to ancient religion and philosophy, ancient people really liked antiquity. In the ancient world, people liked ancient stuff. If you were a new religion, there was something wrong. You, you had to have an old religion. Religions had to be old to be acceptable. Philosophies had to be around for a while to be accepted. You've got to, be, you've got to have antiquity. Christians had to have the Old Testament because it gave them antiquity. They could claim that their religion was as old as Moses. Moses predicted Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. The law was looking forward to Jesus. And so Christians had to have the Old Testament, and they claimed the Old Testament, and they claimed the Old Testament was theirs and not the Jews. Because if the Jews could rightly claim it, then the Christians could not rightly claim it. Christians wanted to rightly claim it because they needed antiquity in order to, to, uh, to have any credentials at all in the ancient world. Even though they have the law of Moses, most Christians chose not to follow the law of Moses. Most Christians were Gentile. They didn't circumcise their baby boys. They didn't follow kosher food laws. They didn't observe the Sabbath. They didn't keep the Jewish festivals. They didn't do the other parts of the law. They didn't keep the law, but they did want to keep the words of Jesus because they understood that the words of Jesus were a kind of new law. Jesus is the one who tells us how we should live. We keep the Old Testament because it, it provides us with our ancient roots, but actually we follow the laws given by Jesus. And the question is, are these laws given by Jesus meant to be reinterpretations of the law, or are they meant to be replacements of the law? This was an issue that different Christians had different views on, as we have seen. There remain Christians, and still remain Christians, who think that Christians should still follow the Jewish laws. Other Christians think that the law is an important part of the Christian canon, but it's not to be followed. My sense is that there are a lot of Christians in the world today who think that we have the law, we have the Old Testament, but they aren't really sure of why they have the Old Testament. This was a source of confusion in the ancient world, and I think it continues to be a source of confusion today. Thank you very much.